The light of our lives comes from the sun and other stars. A form of electric and magnetic energy, photons of light travel through space behaving both like particles and waves. Like ripples in a quiet pool of water, changing electric and magnetic fields of light can be seen far away from their point of origin. Light travels at a constant speed for hundreds, thousands, even millions of years to get here. There's distant light in the universe billions of years old. Even the light from the star nearest our sun, Proxima Centauri, takes 4.3 years to arrive, and that's traveling at 186,000 miles per second, the fastest speed in the universe. To collect light, our eyes function something like cameras, with lenses and pupils controlling the amount of light absorbed. Much of the light in space is too distant for our eyes to see detail and color without assistance. To peer farther into space, Galileo pioneered the use of a telescope in 1609. Like all lenses, these refractor telescopes bent parallel rays of light passing through glass and converged them on a single focal point. Images were magnified with an eyepiece. These early telescopes collected no more light than modern binoculars. To see farther, these telescopes would need to become larger, but they could only grow so much. Lenses wider than three feet may distort, causing a distortion in the image as well. Refracting telescopes gave way to reflectors. They bounce light from one or more reflective surfaces to a prime focus. Reflective mirrors need less support than lenses and can be made larger than refracting telescopes. The mirror on this reflector is nearly 14 feet across. The reflector has two mirrors. Light bounces off the big mirror, then off a small mirror to a focal point where it's recorded and stored electronically. Today, the largest reflector telescopes are in Hawaii on a 14,000 foot peak called Mauna Kea. The Keck telescope's two mirrors are more than 30 feet across and are made in movable pieces that can shift to compensate for changes in the atmosphere. As better and better telescopes help us capture light farther and farther away, we can see light older than man and as old as the universe. We are living through a communications revolution. Light running through hair-thin fibers made of glass allows us to send information farther and faster than ever before. Fiber optics carry voices, information, and pictures on beams of light around the globe. A single wire can carry some 300 billion bits of information per second. What I'm holding in my hand is a piece uh, of that original fiber, and this was a piece of the fiber that uh, started the optical fiber communication revolution. Dr. Don Keck is one of the three scientists who developed fiber optics at the Corning factory in upstate New York in 1970. Dr. Keck and his colleagues created these revolutionary fibers using old ideas. In 1880, Alexander Graham Bell was hard at work on a photophone. Bell sent telephone messages 600 feet using a beam of light. But Bell's phone went dead in the dark. No light no conversation. Eighty years later, scientists found the solution. Glass pure enough to carry a signal over great distances. Getting there took 13 years of experiments. The process involves building up and breaking down glass cooked under extremely high temperatures. 
pure silica is built layer upon layer inside a glass tube to make a fine glass rod. The rod, called a preform, gets subjected to more heat. After 15 minutes, the pure glass begins, once again, to melt. As it drips down, it forms thin fiber optical threads. One rod turns into one half mile of fiber, rolled up like so much fishing line. We could send the Encyclopedia Britannica three times a second over one of these fibers. Scientists have projected that perhaps as many as 12 billion television signals could be sent over a single optical fiber. Fiber optics already carry computer and telephone messages around the world. Less expensive and far more efficient, fiber optics will likely replace nearly all copper wire sometime in the early 21st century. More information reaches our brains through sight than through any other sense. We rely on sight to give our world color and perspective. Visible light comes into our eyes and is converted into electrical signals, translated by our brain as sight. First, light enters the cornea. The organ's clear curved surface bends light rays that travel on through the pupil. Muscles in the eye's colored iris control the amount of light the pupil accepts. The iris expands in low light and contracts in bright sun. Rays of light move on through the vitreous, a clear jelly that fills much of the space in the eye. Ultimately, light focuses on the retina at the back of the eye. In the retina, specialized cells soak up light and turn its energy into a stream of electrical signals. Most of these are rod cells, long, thin, and capable of collecting dim light. We see in color only because of these short, stubby cone cells that work best in bright light. Our eyes distinguish thousands of colors, yet we have only three kinds of cone cells to make the distinctions. One picks up a wide range of colors. Others collect reflected green light. And a third is sensitive to blue. Nerve cells mix the signals like a paintbrush and give us the illusion of a rainbow of colors. Rods and cones respond to light by generating electrical impulses that travel out of the eye, through the optic nerve, to the brain. And we can finally see the light. For hundreds of years, Astronomers saw only that part of the universe visible to our eyes. But visible light is a mere sliver of the broad range of light energy that the universe sends our way. Electromagnetic energy exists on a spectrum, varying according to the length of its waves. The shortest waves are called gamma rays. The longest are radio waves. Our eyes can only see the waves in the very middle of the spectrum, visible light. Since we are missing so much of the spectrum, we rely on scientific instruments to reveal the universe. Just beyond our range of vision, on the short end of the spectrum, extreme ultraviolet light is absorbed by the ozone layer of our atmosphere. 
A satellite called the International Ultraviolet Explorer was the first craft to gather the rays in space and to see, for instance, the streams of gas between small clusters of stars. Longer than visible light waves, infrared radiation may be absorbed by water and carbon dioxide and is best studied from mountains like Mauna Kea in Hawaii, where the air is relatively dry, or from space telescopes like Hubble. Our eyes see the Orion Nebula as a group of stars obscured by dust and gas. Hubble's infrared image reveals young stars in full bloom. If we could see radio waves, the longest waves of all, we would see a sky full of galaxies instead of stars. But we need electronic equipment to pick them up. Most radio waves do penetrate the atmosphere, so we can gather them up with ground-based dishes. A radio wave image of the galaxy Cygnus A shows red clouds of gas invisible to optical telescopes. A remarkable NASA satellite called COBE is even helping us see the universe close to the beginning of time. Measuring infrared and microwave radiation, COBE picks up remnant heat from the Big Bang called cosmic microwave background radiation. While we're seeing stars, Kobe envisions a time before stars and galaxies even existed. Gathering the full range of electromagnetic energy gives us a richer view of the universe. In the depths of the ocean, there are creatures that chemically produce their own light and put it to use in some surprising ways. Dr. Edie Witter is a specialist in bioluminescence. Her research is taking her on a dive off the coast of Cuba in search of bioluminescent marine animals living in the midwater range between 500 and 2,000 feet below the surface. We're only down about 60 feet and the light is decreasing exponentially. As you go down deeper, down around 250 feet, you're down to 10% of the light you had at the surface. And at 500 feet, it's down to 1%. About there is when plants lose the ability to photosynthesize. There's not enough light there for them to grow. As the submersible descends with its lights on, the world outside looks black and lifeless. But turn off the artificial lights, and the natural light show begins. Animals use their light in a variety of ways, as a defense against predators, as a means of camouflage, to see by, to find food, and to communicate in the dark. Their lights are not only breathtakingly beautiful, they're critical to their survival. And I believe these secret lights represent the most important and yet least understood animal behavior in the ocean. The jellies are the brightest sources of bioluminescence in the ocean. They just produce spectacular light shows. In order to observe and study their bioluminescence in a laboratory, we must first capture them without destroying them. Three hours into the dive, all the sample containers are filled, and it's time to head back to the surface and the onboard lab. In a small plastic dark room, Dr. Witter records the light shows of each of the jellies she's collected. There are three different bioluminescent displays that I've been finding in these jellyfish. One of them's incredibly brilliant, literally a burglar alarm. What happens is when a jelly finds itself in the clutches of a predator, such as a fish, it starts producing these waves of luminescence, like a movie marquee. It's trying to attract the attention of a larger predator that may come and see the fish and attack it and afford the jelly an opportunity for escape. The other type of display is when a jelly releases a cloud of bioluminescent particles into the water, thereby attracting attention away from itself. This jelly can shoot sparkles into the eyes of a predator and then swim away into the darkness. 
third display is where the luminescence is very dim. That display, I believe, is a warning to whoever bumped into the jelly that you don't want to mess with me. I'm toxic. Dr. Witter's research is helping to reveal the deep ocean. By chemically producing light, these creatures thrive in a sunless world. <laughs> 